It was awful. The worst moment of all was the Buckingham Palace concert, where the poor Queen pledged allegiance to the vile new culture of talentless celebrity. Any institution that has to suck up to uh, Grace Jones and uh, Paul McCartney to get down with the kids has plainly lost the will to live. It is a measure of how bad things have got that Her Majesty has to pretend to like the cacophonous, semi-literate, musically trite rubbish that seems to have invaded almost every space in this country. I bet she loathes it, really. Its songs are the hymns and anthems of the modern religion of the self. Self-pity, self-indulgence, drugs, loveless sex. They are the exact opposite of the Queen's Pledge, made on her 21st birthday in 1947, that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. Uh, that was a, uh, I think he's a journalist, is he? Peter Hitchens, who, uh, is that right? The, he's the brother of... Um, of Christopher Hitchens, I think. He is, Tom. And given that you've never heard of him, that was an uncanny impersonation of somebody you've never heard of. <laughs> well, I, you, I think the, uh, the character emerges from, <laughs> from, from, the the pros. Pros. from the prose. So, um, yeah, so he was right. That was uh, Peter Hitchens writing on the Jubilee uh, in 2012. So what, which one was that? I can't remember. Uh, At least track of my Jubilee. So that's the diamond, <laughs> the diamond, that's the diamond Jubilee, Jubilee of Elizabeth yes. II. And um, people will probably have noticed that this week uh, we are celebrating the 70th Jubilee. The Platinum the Queen, Jubilee. The Platinum Jubilee. Uh, so the Queen very much set it breaking all records. And we thought it would be fun, didn't we, Dominic? Actually, you did. It's, it's your idea. It's a brilliant idea. Was. To look at the history of Jubilees. Yes, because actually the Jubilees, it was a sort of mad idea on my part. But then when we started looking into it, I think we realized that Jubilees are, are actually weirdly profoundly interesting because they're great punctuation points they're the moments when britain has has stopped and sort of taken stock of itself and actually the really interesting thing that comes through from the jubilees as we will discover in the next sort of 45 minutes to an hour or so it's not the spectacle of the monarch waving from the balcony i mean that never changes and it's actually not very interesting what's interesting are all the other things that are going on and the things that the country says about itself yeah where britain thinks it is and i think as we'll see with its imperial history in particular the sort of the the enmeshing of the personality of the monarch and the position of the royal family with the narrative about britain and its place in the world yeah. is really really interesting so it's a kind of temperature check yeah on the health and and fever exactly. of the nation yeah um you said britain do, do other monarchs celebrate jubilees of course they must the dutch the danes the norwegians but you're uh, well you know about jubilees better than i do so i don't even know where the word comes from so the Jub well the jubilees it's biblical and it's in leviticus e every seventh year so that's the you know the yearly equivalent of the sabbath um the children of israel are, are commanded to celebrate the the sabbatical year which basically means you know don't leave your fields fallow um, free your slaves, all that kind of stuff. And yeah. so you have seven sabbatical years. And then the year after that, which is the 50th year, that's the Jubilee. So Jubilee is a 50th anniversary. And don't they have Catholic Jubilees? Doesn't the Pope do something? Yeah. So that's, so that was introduced by, um, uh, Boniface the eighth, who was, I think we actually talked in the members, um, episode about famous slaps in history. Famous do you remember slaps. that? <laughs> Famous slaps oh, yeah. in history. He got slapped. So he was the Pope and he got slapped by uh, people who'd burst into his um, summer residence on the orders of the French king. So he's Boniface VIII is the Pope before the Avignon exile and he gets into a massive bust up with the, with the King of France. But in 1300, he instituted um, a jubilee. So, and what there's some doors. When I was at St. Peter's last year, I noticed there was some door that only gets opened in a jubilee. Well, the, I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not sure why either. <laughs> The papacy has, well, the Catholic Church has jubilees, I think, every 25 years now. Yeah. And you can have 25, 25th or 50th jubilees. A, a famous uh, example of monarchies celebrating anniversaries was in ancient Egypt. So you have the Sed, oh, right. the Sed Festival, which yeah. was celebrated every, uh, after 30 years, and then kind of, I don't know, four or five years after that and so on. And the whole aim was designed to restore the, um, the masculine potency of the pharaoh. <laughs> So that's something that hasn't passed into no, our own no. Although tradition. it might have done for uh, one of the Georges. The, uh, although typically, um, friend of the show, Akhenaten, he celebrated his said after three years. Oh, so ever the, ever the rebel. And of course, we've done the, um, the Shah's great party at the beginning of the 1970s. 
to mark the one billionth anniversary. Of the, <laughs> yeah, two thousand five hundredth <laughs> anniversary yeah, of Cyrus of, yeah. of the Persians. So, yeah, and actually, one of the interesting things about when jubilees first came in in Britain is that in the Victorian period there was some resistance to them because they were thought of as un-British. But why um, did they come in? So it's with George the Third is the first, right? So the first one is George is, is George the Third. So I, I suppose you could argue one reason they come in is simply because George the Third is setting sort of breaking all records. records for longevity. But also the timing, I think, is really important. So it's a, it's a very odd jubilee, this one. Um, to, you might say, uh, overseas listeners might say it's sort of typically British in that it's kind of in the wrong year because he came to the throne in 1760, but he has his jubilee in October 1809. So it's when he's entering into his 50th year rather than marking 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think pretty it's pretty clear that the... The reason that the Jubilee happens is really because Britain's in the Napoleonic Wars. And, and they, want, they want to cheer everyone up. Is yeah, the and the war hasn't been going terribly well, so the British have been fighting in Flanders, and that's completely bogged down. Wellington's gone off to um, the Peninsula for the Peninsula War, but nothing has been heard from Wellington for some months, I think. And nobody really knows what's – of course, because the news is, takes a long time to reach – Britain, so nobody really knows what's going on in the peninsula war. Everybody's tired, you know, food prices are high, everybody's a bit miserable. Um, so the anniversary, so George the Third's fiftieth, is a great opportunity for people to cheer themselves up, but also to sort of feel good about being British. The other thing, of course, is that some of our I know we have a lot of American listeners, and they may say, George the Third, what a terrible tyrant and stuff, but of course that's not at all how he was perceived in Britain. No, good King um, George. Yeah, he's farmer George. He's very, very popular by and large with the with the people he has he has he gone mad yet he's had episodes of madness so this is this is actually one of the tragic things about george the third um so this is pretty much his last moment of sanity before well, it's a nice his, way to go out his daughter dies a year later and that just drives him completely over the brink into madness and he spends the rest of his life mad so this is like a this really is his last kind of hurrah and basically, it's very 18th century. I mean, it's, I know it's 1809, but it feels very 18th century. So they have ox roasts in kind of towns and villages across Plum the country. Plum duff. Plum duff, lots of beer, lots of sermons. Everybody sings God Save the King. Um, there are some sort of nice elements. So he, I mean, George is, is quite absent because his health is so poor. I mean, he's old. He's, he's old. He's also mentally very frail. But uh, and there's a big fate um, at Windsor that he goes to with his family and there are fireworks. Is that the one where there's um, the figure of Britannia being pulled to and fro in a chariot drawn by seahorses and illumined yeah. by fireworks? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's, I and mean, that, that, that's a more stuff. striking spectacle was never witnessed. Yes, yeah, so some, you do Which get- I find hard some, to believe. <laughs> <laughs> but you do get some people writing accounts of this. So they clearly know it's a kind of red letter day. Um, so there's a, an account of the celebration of the Jubilee collected and published by a lady, the wife of a naval officer. And that's the sort of one of the, these sort of sources that we get all this from, because obviously there aren't that many sources for this compared with subsequent Jubilees. But what we do know is military deserters, prisoners of war are pardoned, but not if they're French. And so... And this is being held on the anniversary of the Battle of Agincourt, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's, so, battle, so, so, it's, it's, it's very anti -French. a kind of anti-French theme to the whole thing. There absolutely is. Yeah. Um, but some of the things that we now associate with Jubilees, so for example, I mean, I've still got somewhere my Silver Jubilee mug from 1977. The sort of, the, the creation of kind of China plates and mugs and things like that. I mean, that obviously, this is a time when people do love to have China mugs yeah. and plates. And, and, and it's stuff. a kind of absolute boom time, isn't it, for, for the potteries? And exactly, exactly. And that's, that's, I mean, what the reason we do it now is partly a sort of legacy from all this. So it's a day, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a, a, it's a nice sort of jamboree, but it's nothing massively more than that. You know, people don't use that first jubilee as an opportunity for tremendous introspection. I mean, it's sort of a part. No. I, it would really be forgotten, actually, it's had a kind there of, not been subsequent jubilees. It's a kind of Merry England. It is Merry England. It's very Merry England. Merry England and then going mad um, <laughs> a, a few months later. Poor old, you know what, George III is very sad. I was reading Andrew Roberts's biography that came out last year, um, and he's basically spent the last 10 years of his life weeping uncontrollably and endlessly tying up handkerchiefs and unbuttoning mm -hmm. unbuttoning waistcoats i think that they banned um productions of king lear didn't they did they i think they uh, maybe that's an urban myth I, so it, um in his biography roberts basically blasts holes in the thesis that george had porphyria 
he says that's rubbish. He he thinks he had um, manic depression, and and that the treatment just kind of made it. The treatment was so harsh that it just made it a million times worse, and the treatment you know compounded the existing problem. And that that's you know it wasn't it wasn't some genetic you know it wasn't mm-hmm. some inherited kind of physical um, uh, complaint as has often been suspected. Anyway, that's a subject for another day. So that's the first jubilee. That's eighteen oh nine. Um, and then there's a big break. So and an awful lot changes, obviously, in the next 80 or so years. So by the time we get to number two, which is Victoria's Golden Jubilee, 1887, I mean, Britain's in a very different position then. Um, and this is the first time that you get, I think, it's still very much focused on the monarch, but it's the first time when people are sort of slightly stopping to say, aren't we great? We're top nation. Mm all of this kind of stuff. And the, you, you get an imperial element, I think. There had been some parties in, in Bom- what was then Bombay for George III, but you get the imperial element really coming through, as we shall see in a second. So 1887 is the year of A Study in Scarlet. It's the year of H. Ryder Haggard's book, She. Um, you know what Lord Salisbury gave, what the cabinet gave um, Queen Victoria, Tom? I do, because you've uh, sent it on your notes. Yeah, um, I have. They, <laughs> he, sent, he sent the Queen a picture of himself. Yeah. <laughs> 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 very, uh, very nice. So Victoria's been on the throne since 1837. And she's obviously lost Prince Albert. She's been through a great sort of trough of unpopularity, but she's come. She's just come out the other side now. Has she? So, or, is, or does this help her come out? Of I the think it probably a bit of both. I think she has come out of it, but but it's it definitely helps. Um, she has a uh, she has a great banquet with foreign kings and princes. So there were no foreign kings and princes for George the Third's jubilee. Well, they wouldn't be able to travel, would they? No, exactly. But now there's all kinds of, there's the King of Denmark and there's Willy of Greece and there's all these kind of... And presumably one of the reasons that it's not just that, that transport's improved and that Britain isn't at war with the continent, but yeah. also that um, basically they're all related to Queen Victoria. Exactly, exactly. So, so already it's a family she's, gathering. She's the it's, matriarch of Europe, yeah. absolutely. Um, on the 21st of June, which is the really big day, she has a parade um, through London and there are, in, there are Indian troops in the parade so there we'll see more indians later on um both in this jubilee and in the next jubilee but there's a big um uh sort of big service the queen of hawaii is there tom mm-hmm. i know you're a big yes fan we're of a big fan of the queen of hawaii queen, aren't we yeah would you like to tell everybody the queen of hawaii's name <laughs> you've got the notes in front of me no i i don't think so um, it's um <laughs> queen liliu well, kalani i think it is yes yeah, you didn't have the courage to pronounce it, but um, well, it's because anyway. it's because I'd forgotten what her name was. <laughs> um, I'm going to be honest. Anyway, the Queen has this tremendous time. Victoria, she just spends she writes. She writes all about it in her journals, and she says, "You know, I felt truly grateful, never to be forgotten." Day, blah blah. My dear Albert, my dear Albert, blah blah <laughs> yeah. blah, blah blah. She has a she has a United Kingdom dress, doesn't she? She does with shamrocks, shamrocks on it and, and roses um, and thistles. so. Obviously, the Irish question is very much in the air in the right. late 1880s. <laughs> yes, and um, well, there are two elements for this jubilee. So this is her her golden jubilee that are worth investigating. So one is Ireland, and the other. Is India? Which do you think? What should you like to do first? I think the Irish one is so extraordinary that that you should tell people about that. So the Irish. So so this. It's very. When I describe it, it will sound completely demented. Um, Lord Salisbury, who had given the Queen a portrait of himself, um, part of him clearly envisaged that this might be the last gift she would ever get, because he was orchestrating a fool's flag. <laughs> Um, terrorist, terrorist bombing attack. plot <laughs> against her and himself <laughs> and he, themed he, around he, the Jubilee. He, he told his daughter not to go. Yeah, well, I, uh, I think the head of, no, it was the head of the Metropolitan Police. Uh, the head of the Metropolitan Police did. Told his children not yeah. to go. I mean, it's <laughs> extraordinary. So this is an amazing, amazing story. And it was uncovered by a guy who um, called Christy Campbell, who used to work for the Sunday Telegraph. He uncovered this about 20 years ago. And, and basically what happened was this, sort of Fenian terrorism, is a big issue in the late 1880s. And sort of Irish republicanism, Irish nationalism generally is is a massive issue. But also Uh, um, Irish-American terrorism. exactly. That's right. Sort of supported from America. And um, Lord Saul's, but also Parnell, the great sort of Irish Mm -hmm. um, sort of independent spokesman, the great sort of firebrand, the darling of the kind of... The Nicholas Sturgeon of... Exactly. He's more than Nicholas Sturgeon. He's, he's, He's the Nelson Mandela. Of, of Ireland. And um, Lord Salisbury wants to discredit him. 
And the way he does it, he thinks, well, I'll organize, you know, I'll, I'll basically organize a, uh, a terrorist plot against me, the Queen, and everybody else at the Jubilee and make sure that Parnell is associated with it. I mean, obviously, Salisbury doesn't intend for the plot to succeed. So they they basically get this guy called General Francis Millen, who's a, who's a mercenary who has been born in Tyrone, and he's got lots of links with America, so he can get money and dynamite and all this sort of stuff and from people in Chicago and Pittsburgh. Millen is actually working for British intelligence. And, and has been for years, yeah, hasn't he? So he has. The thing that's... The whole story reminds me of is, um, uh, is it the Valley of Fear, the Sherlock Holmes? Oh yes, yeah. story where there's it's it's all about um, undercover agents and Americans coming to Britain and engaging in these kind of plots. That's I right. What wonder whether Conan Doyle had picked up something? Maybe because you know, that's often because the... there's also the um, the uh, is it the Orange Pips? That's about the Ku Klux Klan operating in Britain, isn't it? As, um, oh, maybe that's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, um, but there's a lot of this sort of stuff in the air. In the 1880s and 1890s. So that wouldn't surprise me. Anyway, um, basically, the American Fenians provide dynamite and money and stuff. And there are two guys, Thomas Callan and Michael Harkins, and they sail to Britain from New York. And um, now it, 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 there's a bit of a shambles because they don't actually arrive. Um, <laughs> they don't arrive until the very day that the Jubilee has started. The procession is happening. They're meant to be blowing up as, as is happening. So they're hours away. They're in Liverpool. They don't even get there until it's too late. Um, but then they sort of just, you know, travel around Britain, making contact with other sort of little um, sort of units, sort of Fenian units. And that basically gives away the entire Fenian network in Britain to the and British. It gets rolled up. Yeah. But, but it, as you say, the head of the Metropolitan Police's secret department, who was a man called James Monroe, he did tell his children not to go. The, I mean, that's very Guy Fawkes, isn't it? To the service. It's very Guy Fawkes. Yeah. Um, and they did try to um, associate it with Parnell. So the government did say, you know, oh, Parnell knew about this. Um, this shows how terrible the whole thing is. And it is a bizarre that Lord Salisbury knew about it. Mm. And sort of, but of course, the Salisburys have have form with this. I they? know. So, so <laughs> exactly. Uh, so the, that's what I was thinking with Guy Fawkes. I mean, it goes all the way we, back to yeah. Because we said in our Guy Fawkes podcast, we yeah. talked about whether his ancestor had really been the architect of the gunpowder plot. Yeah. So maybe it's just a family tradition. Yeah. <laughs> if any member of the Salisbury family is listening, maybe, maybe they can tell us if they're if they're planning anything this time. <laughs> um, now, the other thing that's really interesting about um, this jubilee is the is the Indian. Um, element too, because of course Eliz uh, Elizabeth Victoria is Empress of India, and it matters to her enormously that there's an Indian element. And she says basically, my way of recognising the Indian sort of side to my life is to have some Indian servants <laughs> along for the for the jubilee, and they yeah. get a man who basically runs a prison um, to to send to recommend two people, and one of them is this man who ends up being called the Munchie. He's Abdul Karim. And he's the son of a hospital assistant. Um, and he he's from uh, near Jansi. It's the home to the Rani of Jansi. Who who's is the Rani of Jansi? The Rani of Jansi is the uh, the queen who takes a leading role in um, what the British called the Indian Mutiny. And oh, very good. Indians called the, what is it, the First War of Independence or something. Right. Um, and uh, she's a flashman. Oh, yeah, you, of course she is. Of course she is. Um, yeah. but the, and so, you so either she'd, she'd played cricket with you or she'd <laughs> been to bed with Flashman, one or the other. Um, so so there's a, a, obviously a kind of queenly link there. Very nice. So only the munchie comes, he, he's Abdul Karim. He arrives in June the, of the 1887, the year of the um, Jubilee. He first serves Victoria at breakfast um, two days after the Jubilee and they become tremendous friends. He teaches at Urdu. He gives her, makes her curries. All this sort of carry on, and um, everybody else hates him, don't they? They, um, yeah. they really resent him. They think that she was infatuated with him, a bit like. Um, and is this before or after she has her fling with Billy Colony? That I don't know. Actually, I'm thinking after. I think after. Okay. Because I think the Munchie is sort of a, a bit of a replacement. Because they've, they've had to, there's been two films on that, haven't there? There's there's been the one with the Munchie and the one with John Brown. Yeah, that's right. Um, and as, obviously she became slightly infatuated, didn't she? she we yeah. know from her, her, the way she was wrote about Prince Albert, that she's quite of a, she's a very, she's a woman of strong feelings, shall yes. we say. <laughs> yes. And yes. I think some of the correspondence was destroyed, um, after her death or after his death anyway. Um, uh, yeah. On, on the orders of Edward VII. 
Exactly. Um, who was, probably just because it was a bit embarrassing rather than kind of, I, I'd be very surprised if it was kind of lewd correspondence <laughs> or something. Right. Well, um, we're going very slowly, Tom, very slowly. Well, should we have a break now and then come Maybe back? Maybe we should have, have a break now Jubilee, and return for the Diamond which is, Jubilee. Which is the absolute, I mean, that's, it's the acme. It's the apogee it, of Jubilees. It's absolutely the top Jubilee. So yeah. that's something to look forward to. Okay, so we will see you back after the break. And when we come back, um, we will uh, we'll be here with Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. There were hussars from Canada and carabiniers from Natal, camel troops from Bikina and Dayak headhunters from North Borneo, wearing bright red pillbox hats and commanded by Captain W. Raffles Flint. The 17 officers of the Indian Imperial Service troops were all princes, and the Hong Kong Chinese police wore conical hats. There were Malays and Sinhalese and houses from the Niger and the Gold Coast, Jamaicans in white gaiters and ornately embroidered jackets, British Guyana police in caps like French gendarmes, Cypriot Zaptiers whose fezes struck so jarring a chord that some of the crowd hissed them, supposing them to be Turks, and a jangling squadron of Indian lancers led by a British officer in a white spiked helmet. London had never seen such a spectacle. One of the Maoris weighed 28 stone. One of the Dayaks had taken 13 human heads. That was Jan Morris um, writing uh, the middle volume of Pax Britannica, describing the Jubilee procession. Um, and Dominic, you said before the break that this is the top Jubilee. Um, yeah, and basically, definitely. it's the top Jubilee because it, it coincides with the, the apogee of British imperial self-confidence. It absolutely does. So I think it's the top jubilee, both, as you say, because Britain's at its zenith, but also because it's by far the most interesting. Because people at the time absolutely took this jubilee as, uh, they took it as the crowning glory um, of the 19th century, the sort of climax, the moment that proved Britain was indisputably top nation. Actually, and when I say people, I don't just mean people in Britain thought that. People thought that overseas. Right, was yes, the, they did, didn't they? Um, so even yes. the New York Times... Well, I mean, the, the, we'll get into the details of the Jubilee in a second, but as you say, the New York Times said, we are a part, it boasted, it boasted, we are a part and a great part of this greater Britain, which seems so plainly destined to dominate the planet. So that's 1897. I mean, there's, there's a brilliant poem by a guy called Alfred Raleigh Goldsmith, writing in Philadelphia. Our father's land, our mother's home, by freedom glorified. Her conquering sons, the wide world roam and plant her flag in pride. For England's fame, for thy loved name, have bled, have won, have died. Victoria, Victoria, long live our nation's queen. Yeah, that's extraordinary, by an American. isn't it? That's extraordinary. Yeah. And the Kaiser sends a telegram and um, Kruger's in the middle of the Boer War, releases two British prisoners to mark the occasion. So it's, um, it, it, it is a kind of international occasion. Yeah. So, well, on the, there's, they've just had the Jameson raid in South Africa. That's the, the prisoners that he's... Um, releasing but yes there's so britain is now has an empire with 450 million people in it um and it's expanded uh, it, it's 10 times the size it was when victoria came to the throne i mean that's incredible isn't it um the the amount of change that has happened since she came to the throne also obviously since that first jubilee of george the third is is astonishing so we're now in a world of electric light of the telegraph of obviously of railways of all kinds of sort of developments that are going to lead to the cinema and motor cars, planes, all this sort of stuff. Um, friend of the show, uh, Lord Kitchener, is uh, is currently avenging the death of very much a friend of the show, General Gordon, mm -hmm. in the Sudan at the time. So the Battle of Omdurman is so looming. Imperial sort of imperial. I mean, can I say jingoism? I suppose I. I oh no, the only person who's going to be cross is myself. Um, imperial jingoism is absolutely at its height in the late eighteen nineties, and. The, the sort of one of the key political figures of the time, the man who makes the weather, as people said, is the colonial secretary, Joseph Chamberlain, Birmingham man. And he um, says, let's use the Jubilee as basically a festival of empire. And so the whole thing must be about the empire. So actually, Victoria takes a, a although she's the focus of it, she takes a bit of a back seat, partly because she's got um, horrendous kind of arthritis and stuff. So she can't really join in with all the sort of activities. And you know who she has? Well, you do know because you've got the notes. So on um, the, the night of the 21st of June, she has dinner with Fran Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Yeah, amazing. Um, amazing, yeah. The, the Kaiser doesn't go, I don't think. But he does, as I said, send, he sends a telegram. Yeah, he's probably worried about footwear. <laughs> <Do you know? laughs> 
No, I think he, I think he'd he'd definitely wear the right footwear for, to a but jubilee. He would be I think it's, not being the it's yachting. Of attention. It's yachting that scrambles him. I, yeah. I think I think military possessions he's absolutely on top of. But <laughs> talking of, te- of telegrams and, and the imperial, Victoria sends a telegram, doesn't she? She goes to the the telegram room in Buckingham Palace and yeah. uh, the message from my heart. I thank my beloved people, and it goes winging away. It does. She presses a button. The, it literally is the across the she cables. Presses, uh, she presses an electric button to Canada and, and Australia moment. and India and Africa. Exactly. And all the reaches of the British Empire. Um, and then they have this, as you described, this extraordinary parade. So, I mean, people from all corners of the earth who are sort of cheered by the crowd. The crowds have never seen anything like it. So there are hundreds of thousands of people on the streets of London watching this colossal, colossal parade. Um, do you know what the Daily Mail said of the of the parade, Tom? Uh, up they came, nonsense. more and more rubbish. No, no, no. <laughs> they said up they came, more and more new types, new realms at every couple of yards, an anthropological museum, a living gazetteer of the British Empire. Um, the Queen obviously loves all this because she loves being Empress of India. She loves being the head of the empire. Um, there's a court circular published that says that she addressed her troops in Hindustani. Uh, which was completely made up. But when they, she was shown this, she said, they said, she said, you can print it anyway, because I could have done so had I so wished. Could she? So she a, learned, she learned, um, maybe so she learned it from in the, Urdu. Maybe she'd learned it from the Munshi. I don't know. I, I think actually she couldn't have done. But I but think she could have um, done it in Urdu. Well, yeah, I suppose she could. It depends how much she'd retained from the Munshi. Yeah. Um, but anyway, interesting. Yes. So maybe if there are any qu- experts on Queen Victoria's facility with Indian languages. So, let us um, know. The, the newspaper that I just referred to, Britain's favourite newspaper, then has now, um, they had a special edition pu- printed in gold ink for the daily, special golden edition of the Daily Mail. Every edition is a golden edition, Tom. Very anyway, vulgar. Um, <laughs> Shouldn't have been were, printed in diamond. It should have been printed in diamond. Do you know what their editorial said? How many oh. millions of years has the sun stood in heaven? <laughs> but the sun never looked down until yesterday upon the embodiment of so much energy and power. Hmm. Death has bros. I think, I think Augustus death. would perhaps disagree. <laughs> but there are two really interesting sort of side notes. So one is Joseph Chamberlain, who had orchestrated the whole thing, is a great – he's a big believer in protectionism, in imperial unity, all this stuff. And he, and he hosts a colonial conference as soon as the Jubilee is over with the 11 prime ministers. So 11 places, Newfoundland, New South Wales, all these sort of places have sent delegations. And they have this great meeting. And he really wants he wants a permanent imperial council. He wants basically an imperial federation um, that will create a greater Britain, a genuine greater Britain. Um, and they basically don't go for it. So that's a bit of a dog that doesn't bark. Because they want to keep their autonomy. Because they want their autonomy. And so even there, at the height of Britain's power in yeah. 1897, at this moment that, as you say, Jan Morris takes as the centerpiece of the entire book, Pax Britannica, the Jubilee, is well, the moment when Britain's power was greater than it ever would be again. Even then, I think there's a sign that actually the sands of time are kind of... Well, yes. And so the, the most famous literary uh, product of, the, of, the, of this Jubilee is a poem by Rudyard Kipling, who yeah. is, of course, famed as the laureate of empire. And at, at the time is, is seen as the kind of the voice of Britain. Yeah, absolutely. He he sums up the, the 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 imperial mood, the imperial spirit, in his his short stories, in his poetry. Um, he he's probably the most famous writer in the world. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. And he gets asked by the Times to write a poem to 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 mark the jubilee. And the poem that he writes isn't at all what people have been expecting because it's called recessional, and it's basically a warning to Britain that it will it it will all vanish. And so the the famous the famous verse in it, far called our navies melt away on dune and headland sinks the fire. Lo, all our pomp of yesterday is one with Nineveh and Tyre. Judge of the nation, spare us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. And um, that was prompted, I think, by him seeing a, a, a review, a kind of review of the, the, the Royal Navy at Spithead. And he was blown away by it and then felt this kind of presentiment of, of doom, yeah. hubris and nemesis. It's one of the fascinating things about Kipling, isn't it? At the same time as he is extolling the empire and he absolutely believes in it and he is the, you know, he's the ultimate kind of, he's the poet laureate of empire. But 
at this at this high point, he writes this poem that is absolutely shadowed by impending doom, well, loss, all that sort of. Yeah, stuff. and I mean, you, of course, he does celebrate empire, but he is also he far from whitewashes it. He, no, he's not. He's, you know, well, he, he's a very thing, alert it? to the the dark side to it. I mean, he's he's a brilliant writer. And we should definitely do an episode on him. We should because um, you know the poem that he originally started writing. Burden. The white man's burden is the poem he started writing in the jubilee year and then he ditched it and then reworked it during the spanish american war when he sent it to teddy roosevelt yeah but i mean the white the message of the white man's burden is utterly different from that of yeah. and, the, and that's the fascinating thing about kipling that yeah. he clearly believes both things equally he believes yeah. in empire but he also knows that it's transitory and that it's flawed and, and all this sort of stuff and i think that's that's what you know why sometimes people sort of disc Kipling and they say oh he's just a sort of crusty old reactionary but obviously that's what but this I mean that that poem recessional it it, it is it, it's a poem that is equal to the the irony of that British imperial apogee yeah I mean yeah, it, right. it 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 conf- it's beautifully conveys the um the mixture of hubris and looming nemesis that obviously yeah. at, a, at a century more distance we can absolutely see in it i think and the other reason it works so well is even at that moment in 1897 britain is being overtaken by the united states and germany economically so yeah. even as people are wearing ever fancier hats mm. and sort of cheering empire with ever more gusto the sort of it, it you know it, it is falling well, beginning to fall behind i mean i wonder if there isn't a rule of imperialism that the more ludicrous the hats worn by imperialists or the yes. headwear, <laughs> the, the nearer to disaster it's, it's coming. I'm sure that's true because actually the, the people who are the imperialists in the 1890s are all about spectacle, pomp, pageantry. Swagger. swagger. Well, the whole thing, I mean, the whole thing is a, a, is a kind of confidence trick, isn't it? It is. Exactly. Of course it is. Of course it is. But of course the people who had built the empire were not really into that because they were hard-nosed entrepreneurs trying to yeah. make money and, you know, they wouldn't have had time to do parades because they were too busy but it's all a kind of slight hint of smoke and mirrors about the definitely the whole shebang um which means that by the next jubilee that is becoming very evident isn't it so the next jubilee is actually a sort of bit of a poor relation of jubilees um it's a friend of the show george v stamp collector uh, mm-hmm. creaser of his trousers at the sides rather than the fronts and the back um very knocked much out right. in the uh, in the first episode of the world cup of Unfairly, I thought, because I really like George V. He's one of my favourite. I like a boring king, and he's a very boring king. He's so boring. Um, yeah, but his boringness is interesting and really yeah. important. Like the Queen's. So, exactly. So, George V has steered Britain from the First World War through the Depression, and it's just coming out of the Depression now, 1935. Uh, it's his Silver Jubilee, so 25 years. Monarchy has had a really tough time, obviously, and if you think about his family, the, yeah. the Kaiser has been booted out in Germany. The Tsar has been executed in Russia, um, but the British monarchy has succeeded by making itself quite humdrum, and he's yeah. a very hum- his humdrumness is what makes him popular. So they, but, I, I do, I, I do like the um, the embroidery kits that were given out that sum him up. Thus, Prince of Sportsman, brilliant shot, but happiest aboard his yacht. Yeah, where of course he does wear the right foot, he the right shoes. Well, he's a sickler. I mean, he he wouldn't let people come to Buckingham Palace if they're in the wrong shoes. And, and I'm not making that up. You know, you Quite had right to, too. You had to wear the right stuff. Mm. So there's a there's a it's not as big as a, bl- a blowout as the other um, jubilees. There isn't really so much of an imperial dimension, certainly not in terms of the parades. Although, of course, his jubilee is celebrated in in parts of the empire because it's the depression. There is a little bit of a shadow. So. There in places where there's high unemployment or there's a, a strong sort of left wing political presence, um, it's not as well supported as elsewhere. So, for example, I, 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 are, are there kind of active demonstrations against it? There aren't really demonstrations, but for example, there's a place in Fife called Lumpinans or Lumpinans, I, I think it's Lumpinans, where local communist councillors oppose celebrating the Jubilee and sort of make a fuss about it and say they're just a bunch of royal parasites. So, um, there's, there are hints of sort of criticism, which there absolutely were not in 1897. George's own speech mentions the depression. So he says, in the midst of this day's rejoicing, I grieve to think of the numbers of my people who are still without work. We owe it to them and not least to those who are suffering from any form of disablement or the sympathy and help that we can give and all this sort of stuff. So there's an acknowledgement of the kind of tough economic times. 
And he's surprised. He's famously very surprised when he goes. He goes on this sort of tour of London, the East End and stuff, and people are cheering and waving flags. And he says, which, again, something that I think is very endearing. <laughs> he says, I had no idea they felt like that about me. I'm beginning to think they must really like me for myself. And which is quite sweet, I think, and quite self-knowing that he knows. I, but do you think that's true? I think people did like him for himself. Actually, I think they liked his hum, his they, they pooterish were, quality. Yeah, his pooterish quality, exactly. Mm. Um, and actually, I think this is a very pooterish jubilee, and that is the point because it's only I I was having a look when I was thinking about this jubilee. It's only a few months, so that it's the previous September. Um, the Nazis had held the Nuremberg rally that Lenny Riefenstahl filmed for the Triumph of the Will. And the contrast between that, you know, with the amazing light shows, with this, this, the choreography, the cinematography, and then this. I mean, the best thing about this Jubilee is they invent an ancestor of Coronation Chicken. And they name a chimpanzee Jubilee at London Zoo. Yes. <laughs> so in other words, it's so <laughs> small scale and mundane and kind of sweet that in a way that kind of – it's a rebuke to the sort of strutting swagger of Mussolini or the or the well, I, I wonder whether um, b because for the dictators and particularly for Hitler, the assumption is that um, fascism is the face of the future. It's powerful. It's dramatic. It's visual, and that um, the democracies are mired in decline and are shabby and dull. Yeah, and it's the difference between a crisp, you know, Nazi uniform and yeah. Chamberlain's wing collar, basically. Yeah, you know, it's fun, you know umbrellas against. Um, whatever the Nazis have, well, it's kind of what turbo it, missiles or whatever. Exactly. What it is is the difference between that that footage you have of crowds at Nuremberg that, who are beside themselves with excitement, screaming at the top of their lungs and doing their Nazi salutes, absolutely invigorated and energized, and they're kind of, you know, in Lenny Riefenstahl's kind of framing. They are prime specimens of humanity, and then meanwhile in London there are people with terrible teeth eating pies under some bunting. But, um, because and of course the poor pie people are going to win. <laughs> Because there's, uh, I mean, there are there are two things that the, the British traditionally have liked to think about themselves, which might seem contradictory. And one is that uh, they don't like to make a fuss, and yeah. that waving flags is for you know we don't obsess about flags, and that's for foreigners. And the other thing is is that we do royal processions terribly well, yes. and they're yeah. obviously completely contradictory. Yeah. But I guess that that this Silver Jubilee in 1935 perhaps uh, you know squares that particular circle, perhaps. Yeah, I think it does, because it's sort of flag-waving in an understated way, isn't it? Yeah, I an mean, apologetic what, way. Apologetic way, which is also true of the next Jubilee, the Silver Jubilee in 1977. Which so, I can actually remember. Yeah, I bet it's I one was, of the very uh, first things I very vaguely remember. So how I was old nine. You? I was nine. nine. Yeah. Um, I, there's a, a photo on my website of myself at the Silver Jubilee. Waving Looking patriotic? Flag. Yeah, I'm waving a flag. Of course. At the age of about sort of... Though it continues. Th three or something. <laughs> yes, exactly. So this is one of the first jubilees where uh, it, it inaugurated the tradition of everybody saying nobody will go. It'll be a terrible disaster. <laughs> Beca It'll because, uh, and no one can um, express, no one can sum this up better than you, 1977, I mean, if 1935 was a bad year for Britain, yeah, relative <laughs> to other countries, 1977 is a terrible year. Yes, it's a, it is a it is a it is a bad year. So we'd just been bailed out by the International Monetary Fund the year before, nineteen seventy six. In nineteen seventy five, we'd set our post war record of twenty six percent inflation. Um, so Jim Callahan is prime minister. Seems to be broken, perhaps. Who knows? Um, well, who knows exactly? Um, we've got a Labour government. Uh, they have a very funny discussion captured in Tony Benn's diaries where Ben wants to give her. Uh, he says, "What should we give her as a present?" He's got a great idea of a vase. He's got a vase that's been carved by a Polish miner, and he thinks something like that carved out of coal would, be, would go down well with them. Um, and it's got to be something that reflects the values of the labor movement. And James, Call and James Callahan, who's very patriotic and an absolutely staunch monarchist, sits through this kind of smiling through gritted teeth and then basically gets his wife to go off and buy the queen a silver coffee pot uh, for which each member of the cabinet has to pay £15. Pounds. Um, Good as a contribution it's like as if the queen didn't have a coffee pot already um so obviously this is the jubilee most famous really for the sex pistols but i think it's probably true to say that um most people are, are not of the sex pistols persuasion um although the song sells you know tons and tons of, of copies uh because there's a great when when the day comes as it always happens with jubilees there's a great sort of outpouring of 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 sort of pat patriotism and, and jollity and stuff and there um, were um i learned from you 
from your notes. There were even special Jubilee editions of Penthouse, Mayfair and Forum. Very 70s. Very 70s. Did your researches uh, lead you to... No, I've never got... (laughs) I bet you can get them on eBay. (laughs) Though I think it's a slightly weird thing trying to stop Again, if any, any, uh, if any listeners out there have copies of the special <laughs> Jubilee edition, we're very interested to know. Of ben House. <laughs> to know and there's lots of um, people are wearing Union Jack pants and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's have... the golden age of the tea towel, isn't it? It is absolutely the golden age of the tea towel. So they do have Republican events. Um, there's, well, there's a rally organized by the Libertarian Communists at Blackheath. But only five people <laughs> turned up, so that wasn't a great um, success. But actually, when you look at the, as I said before at the beginning of the program, what's really interesting is what people say about Britain. Um, so the Times, um, complete contrast with what newspapers had said in 1897, says um, this is its leader. It says the popular imagination can no longer feed on the glories and wonders of empire, nor it has to be admitted as the Britain of 1977, relieved of almost all its imperial baggage, present the sort of spectacle to light in the mind the bonfires of national rejoicing. And Time magazine had a very similar sort of piece. They're looking from America. Um, the past quarter century has witnessed enfeeblement and decline, the end of an empire, the shrinking value of the pound, near stagnation of a formerly innovative economy. It's this grim reality that the Jubilee briefly banished, but it will still be there to challenge Britons when their party is over. So the Silver Jubilee, which I remember quite fondly, because it's basically the first thing I can ever remember, the sort of village fate and stuff. Um, I think it's a great party, but there's a real sense of it being a moment of escapism. And what's it un- rained. otherwise, yeah, exactly. It rained. It rained. It's, it's, uh, an, so, it's an otherwise m- yeah. fairly miserable sort of story. Um, I suppose the, uh, as well as um, Sex Pistols, Derek Jarman made a film called Jubilee the following year. Oh yeah, I know you want had, to. Well, it had uh, Toya, it had Adam Ant. Yeah. Um, and the plot is that Elizabeth I is transported by John oh, Dee yeah. into the present. Uh, and it's kind of, you know, uh, Britain absolutely is worse with fires and drizzle. And I think somebody's just murdered Elizabeth II and the Queen kind of goes around and there are loads of punks. <laughs> That's very Derek Jarman. Yeah. Um, I mean, nothing, but nothing particularly but it's happens. it's also very late 70s, isn't it? Yeah, That's it's very late 70s. Yeah. That sort of bleak, drizzly, miserable kind of thing. Yeah, film. I mean, I, so Jubilee is the, uh, is the 1977 equivalent of Kipling's recessional. Yeah. So there'd be well, an interesting essay there. That's a, that's a very good essay, Tom. I think you should write it. So let's move on. The next Jubilee, uh, we've got two more to go. Uh, 2002. You remember 2002? They all blur. They do blur, so, don't they? <laughs> the last two definitely blur. I, I, um, what it, actually, you know, what I do, I remember about that, or maybe I'm muddling it with the funeral of the Queen Mother, <laughs> but there was, again, there's this great right royal British tradition of saying it's all going to be a disaster and they will be interested. And then actually there were massive, massive crowds. Yes. Well, this is what happens. And I remember all- going out thinking they were, you know, it, not even really being aware that there would be crowds, not even thinking about it to go and get something and finding myself, un, you know, just unable to move because yeah. they were so packed. So the Guardian, the, I, um, the Guardian had, uh, had great fun in the first half of the year saying what a terrible disaster the Jubilee was going to be. Wave that flag and open that champagne, says his columnist John O'Farrell, because for a decade now, nobody has cared about the monarchy. Hooray, we won't have to hold a street party and blah, 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 blah. And then the Guardian published an editorial saying kind of, ha, 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 there aren't going to be any events. The list of events bears a forlorn look. So far, it lists a golden jubilee snooker and pool tournament in Plymouth. <laughs> the, pl- the planting of an oak in the village of Oxhill, Warwickshire. The planting of a jubilee garden at Cranmore Infant School in Shirley, Birmingham. The placing of small fountains all over London and precious little else. And of course, was there anything w- else? Well, there was because there was this. There were these huge concerts. In yeah, but was there, were there any permanent memorials? I don't know. Well, I mean, so the Guardian was right. No. No, because what everybody remembers that jubilee for is Brian, is Brian May. Yes, I do remember Brian May. Brian May on the on. But but know. it's not the equivalent of a great, mighty, flourishing golden or jubilee, whatever it was. Well, you obviously memorial. Stand, you obviously stand with Peter Hitchens uh, <laughs> here, don't you? Who? It's Peter Hitchens, who who you obviously don't know who he is, but uh, you <laughs> you he agrees with you that a rock concert is not appropriate and it's not a. No, I'm fu- I'm I have no problem with rock concerts. So here's the but thing. I'm just I'm just standing up for the Guardian because you're sneering at the Guardian for having I said that, that there are no permanent memorials. And I'm no, no, it didn't right. say there were no permanent memorials. It said there were going to be no good events. Oh, That's okay, what it said. all right, okay, I take That's it. That's what it said. I take it. And back. actually, what happened is, first they hold a classical concert, the Prom at the Palace, and two million people applied for tickets. 
to go and 12,000 went. And then they have this party at the palace, which is really the first time, other than Elton John's appearance at Diana's funeral, that the, ho the House of Windsor had wholeheartedly embraced kind of British pop culture in that way. So Paul McCartney is there and... Eric Clapton is there and whatnot. Well, and, um, and regular there, listeners will remember my brilliant rendition of Paul McCartney oh God, don't singing uh, Her Majesty. But more people watch that, interestingly, than watch the Live Aid concert. That is such a Sandbrook fact. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a Sandbrook fact. <laughs> so, I, so more people watch that and, and also far more people watch the next concert in 2012. Um, 200 million people watch that concert around the world. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. The Queen, of course, she was present, but she wore earplugs. She wore earplugs, yes. <laughs> and, but the, the, um, the best thing about that concert was um, uh, Johnny Rotten, John Lydon. Yeah, he's um, great. Uh, he's a reformed customer, well, isn't he? Well, I mean, he, he's, he's, he, he truly is the greatest punk because he, he obviously hugely enjoys puncturing punk. Yeah. Which is well, the exactly, most punk yes. thing to do. Yeah. So... Um, <laughs> he says Charles, he is a, Charles is a really good bloke who talks to plants. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he now says he really. Well, he's then. Well, few, he's not advertising butter. <laughs> he then said, when I heard William had popped the question to Kate, I had a nice cup oh, of tea for them. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a spirit of 1977. Yeah. So, anyway, I think that was a very important moment because the, the monarchy had been through this big dip with the, in popularity with the death of Diana and their, their, their apparent sort of inability to emote in public and to sort of reconcile themselves to the, to, to the modern world. And basically yeah. the people who organized the Jubilee in 2002, I think the guy was called Sir Michael Pete who organized it. Um, incredibly clever kind of um, spin doctoring because they basically decided to harness the energies of pop and, and make and so that. everyone loved that. And everybody, they knew everybody would love that. And, you know, it just worked incredibly well to sort of revitalize their image and that's what they basically did again 10 years later with the diamond jubilee which is the most recent one 2012 so that which, was the, the, the middle point of a, of a trinity wasn't it so you had the, the kate and william wedding in 2011 and then you had the olympics in london so uh, yes that was the summer i hit my six was that the summer of your, so that was the fourth part of that um yeah so four amazing mighty amazing, events uh, mighty events uh, and i went to see because i had um a friend who had a special berth on the Thames to watch this flotilla of ships go by. Oh yeah. And it was designed you know, to look like a canaletto, wasn't it? Lots it of, was. lots of Tudor type ships. It poured with that, rain, didn't it? During the... it, it didn't just, I mean, it hailed and sleeted <laughs> and it was icy and the poor Duke of Edinburgh had to stand there for kind of three hours and he that's got right. a chill on his bladder. Did he? <laughs> that's right. He had a bladder. <laughs> and it was, I mean, I, I, I thought it was the most admirable thing. I watched as the Queen and Prince Philip went by, but do you absolutely remember what, kind of rigid, to a, what, standing to attention. The big story of that jubilee was the BBC's coverage, which was absolutely mocked and derided because they didn't treat the river pageant. With the <laughs> well, that was it, wasn't it? That was they had they had ill-informed commentary, which called the oh, Queen what? Her Royal Highness instead of Her Majesty, and everybody went absolutely ballistic. Did um, um, did top columnists in the Daily Mail well right trenchant? Do you know what? punchy pieces on this? They, they didn't because I had to go down to that Jubilee. I had to. I, I didn't have to, but I did to be a pundit on the BBC's Jubilee Roundup. And for some complicated logistical reason, I got there an hour too early or something. So they said, oh, sit in here at the back of the sort of control room where the producer who had been outed in the Daily Mail and other newspapers that day and condemned as a traitor to the <laughs> realm, where the producer who was called Ben somebody and was a very media person with kind of precisely glasses. the right kind of trendy glasses, yeah. was sort of sweating and shouting at his underlings and just generally an absolute wreck. Um, and all the underlings were smirking because they had clearly been reading the papers with great enjoyment <laughs> to see him utterly eviscerated by the tabloids. Mm. So anyway, that was good fun. I, <laughs> I enormously enjoyed that. Uh, but that Diamond Jubilee, was, I mean, that was basically a sequel to the Golden Jubilee. It was more pop music, more of the same, which is, I guess, what they're doing this time, isn't it? There's, there's going to be lots of concerts and, I don't know, is Ed Sheeran yes. involved in some way? Isn't Tom, Tom Cruise doing something? Tom Cruise has done it. Oh, has he? What yeah. did he do? He spoke in, in Slough or something? <laughs> I can't remember. What Not it, even Windsor. Well, it might have been in Windsor. I mean, I don't know. He did something. He spoke. He, he looked, as he always does, you know, suspiciously young. 
Um, that completely passed me by. Yeah, Tom, you're not following Tom Cruise's activities with mm. the um, with the attention to detail that I would expect. So what are you doing for the Jubilee, Tom? You know my commitment to getting this book done so that I can do more episodes of The Rest is History. So actually you're sacrificing yourself. I'm sacrificing my ability to share in the mood of national jollity yeah. for the good of this podcast. Are you a great man for street parties? Uh, I'd certainly go to one if it was being laid on. But I wouldn't organise it. Are you? No, I w- I'm, no, I'm not, actually. That won't surprise you at all. You hate right royal flummery, don't you? I just don't like public jollity. No. I, mean, that's, I think, oh, I don't mind a bit of, I don't mind. I like it. I like you like a bit of bunting. I don't mind a bit of bunting. We have some Union Jack bunting, actually. It won't Do surprise you? you to know. Well, I imagine Arthur must be very excited. Uh, they're doing a thing. I'll tell you what they're doing at his school. They're doing a day where everybody, each class, has chosen a country of the Commonwealth and they're going to dress up as that country. <laughs> That's on, very 1935. Right. And they're going to go as a member. And he came home and he said, well, we've got an absolutely excellent one. And I said, who are you all dressing up as? And he said, he said Mozambique. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which and has I just was, joined. And I thought. The English oh, speak, Commonwealth of English speaking nations. It has joined, I think, hasn't it? As, yeah, I think Mozambique has. has joined, although obviously it was part of the Portuguese empire. But I, I foresee, well, I think that, that needs to be sensitively handled. Dressing up as as Mozambique, yes, yes. Because I obviously said, well, are they expecting you know a load of Justin Trudeau style um, costumes? <laughs> and clearly they're not, because that would not be the thing. Um, but I don't know, because I don't want to send him it. I don't know what Mozambique traditional dress is, and I don't want to prejudge it in case we look, yeah, well, cancelable. Yeah. Well, what would you awkward. do faced with that dilemma, Tom? What having to go as Mozambique? As Mozambique. It's a good question. I have no idea. I don't know anything about Mozambique. Well, if listeners have potent thoughts about maybe Mozambique go dress, uh, wildlife, perhaps go as a giraffe. <laughs> go as a giraffe. <laughs> Do they have giraffes in Mozambique? I don't know. Well, the elephants. They have elephants. Well, go as an elephant. You could go as an elephant. I mean, this yeah. is very eighteen ninety seven, isn't it? Ultimately, <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. I, I mean, I think that um, the risk with celebrating a jubilee. Yeah. Is that in decades to come, the photographs will come back and haunt you. It depends how your how your attire, though. If you're just wearing a nice sort of paper Union Jack hat. Sorry. A Union Jack waistcoat. Yeah, if you're wearing um, a no, you see, Union that's Jack exactly hat, the thing. you'll be absolutely fine. No, I think you feel embarrassed. Because as you said, you hate public displays of jollity. Yeah, but I'm not going to be doing it. I wouldn't wear a Union no, Jack hat. No, I'm saying hat. you. you. You wouldn't want that. No, but I wouldn't go out. I mean, I'm not you, going so, to go out. So, so what, you're just going to kind of hunker down. Yeah, my refuse have anything to do with it. Are you going to watch the concert? No, I'd watch the I'd, I'd I'd watch the Queen waving from the balcony, and then I might. Well, we all we all want to see if Prince Andrew's going to be there, don't we? <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> that's because yeah. that's the that's the massive great floater. Tom, I, the, I will be the, waiting the... <laughs> with pen poised to see what <laughs> Harry and Meghan are going to do. Yeah, so are Harry and Meghan going to be allowed there? And will yeah. will uh, Prince Andrew be released out of his dungeon? <laughs> um. So Dom is is saying that Harry and Andrew won't appear. It, no, they're Dom, not welcome. They're Dom, not is, welcome. That, is that absolutely official? That's our producer. Yeah, he's saying. I think it is official that they're not involved. Okay, so well, Tom, that's, what's that's your like favorite? Diminishes the excitement of it. What's your favorite jubilee? If you could have gone to any of these jubilees, well, you did. Oh, eighteen ninety seven. Yeah, eighteen ninety seven. I mean, I thought amazing sort of spectacle George, and show. I like the thought of the ox roasts and the French the plum duff. Yeah, of and the sort of francophobia. Yes, of, um, and the the, the the warm beer of old England. Yeah, I think that would be it. But I think you could, have, you could have had that in 1897 and seen loads of, of headhunters. <laughs> you could, yeah, that would have been it. Yeah, and you'd have you know, read your gold golden ink <laughs> edition of the Daily Mail. That I wouldn't. Would I'd have read it in the Times. Would you? Oh, read Kipling. Oh, you're, well, you know what Lord Salisbury said about the Daily Mail in 1896, 97? I assume something new, disapproving for uh, boot news, boys, isn't it? A newspaper it's, written by office boys for office yeah, boys. Yeah, yeah. I think we've done the Jubilee justice, Tom. I think we have. So we've done multiple Jubilee episodes, yep. which I think is what the It's been a right wants. royal podcast. Uh, <laughs> you've done Her Majesty proud. Uh, we hope you, if you're celebrating, that you uh, enjoy it. Uh, if you're campaigning against it. We hope you don't. Then, <laughs> yeah, I, then we wish you ill. Um, <laughs> No, I think I think it's an opportunity for everyone to enjoy themselves. Oh no, Tom! This is the kind of appeasement mentality that I absolutely will not stand for. <laughs> right. Uh, so, enjoy your street parties. Enjoy street the parties. Have, have a lovely time. If you're if you're not lucky enough to be British, you probably haven't been listening anyway. So, but I'm sure they will be celebrating in Australia and Canada. Or maybe the Americans will be doing reading that poem. <laughs> that would be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> Actually, Dominic, uh, for, yeah. for our American listeners, do you want to just take us out by reading that poem again? Our father's land, our mother's home, by freedom glorified. 
her conquering sons the wide world roam and plant her flag in pride for England's fame, for thy loved name, have bled, have won, have died. Victoria, Victoria, long live our nation's queen. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.